everyone. Welcome to the Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. It's a bunch of moths in here. Oh, that's weird. Moths in the vacuum of space. How does that moths. work? <laughs> Our author spotlights shine the light of discovery on authors from all walks of speculative fiction to help you discover new awesome things to read. Today, we begin by telling you seven things you should know about Anne Leonard. Anne got her BA in fiction from St. John's, an MFA from Pitt, a PhD in English literature from Kent State, and a JD from the University of California Hastings College of Law. That's a lot of book learning. Anne is a Chicago Cubs baseball fan, but Tom let us interview her anyway. Tom likes the Cardinals. Veronica is an SF Giants and a Red Sox fan, for the record. Veronica talks herself in the third person. Uh, Anne Leonard once had a job doing inventory in the Virginia State Prison's license plate shop. Her first name is Elizabeth with an S. She got tired of people shortening it to Liz with a Z, so she started going by Anne. Her first novel, Moth and Spark, is about a prince who has been chosen to free dragons from bondage to the Empire, but nobody's exactly sure how he should do it, not even the dragon riders. He meets a doctor's daughter who discovers that she is a seer, and she's also a commoner, so he really shouldn't fall for her. Hachette UK bills Moth and Spark as the Princess Bride meets Game of Thrones with a dash of Jane Austen. There is an Annie Leonard who writes books about environmentalism and sustainability. Now, we're sure they're awesome, but they're not by Anne Leonard who wrote Moth and Spark, so don't get confused. Is that all there is to know about Anne Leonard? Far from it. Aaron expands the tale in a whiteboard video. There is a signal sort of bravery to launching a writing career. It's something like the ancient Phoenicians must have felt sailing out of sight of land for the first time terribly aware of the vastness of the ocean beyond their comfortable shores and how easy it would be to sink. That's why I respect the heck out of Anne Leonard, or anyone willing to paddle out over the deep simply because they're compelled to tell a story. On the surface, it's a riff on familiar fantasy territory, a political and military struggle between kingdoms, complicated by dragons and magic. But in Leonard's case, that's a story which crosses a number of genre boundaries, between Tolkien-esque medievalism and modern anachronisms, between straight fantasy and romance. The two leads reverse common tropes of power, a prince who is overwhelmed and vulnerable, and a commoner wielding both magic and strong loyalties. That type of twist doubles the risk for a new author, but potentially doubles the rewards for readers who are successfully engaged by work that can both embrace and reinvigorate existing genre conventions. After all, nobody ever discovered new land by staying within sight of shore. That is so exciting. Yes. What a, what, what a good welcome. I'm also a little bit terrified of flying books now. Are you? Even though no, it wasn't supposed to be you're, scary, yeah, but you're still just fun. supposed to embrace the embrace the flying. the flying books. Well, it definitely got me excited to meet the author herself. Yes, and she is here. Welcome and Leonard, aboard. thank you for joining us. Welcome Hi. to the spaceship. Hi. Thanks for coming. Hi. Really appreciate it. Space Castle. This is fantastic. So you've you've had a lot of interesting jobs. You've inventoried license plate shops. You've you've got your law degree. How does that translate into becoming a first time author? I was a writer before I did all those things. Okay. Those were just I don't want to say they were just ways to make my living, but I was always writing the whole time. Doesn't <laughs> translate at all. And on the other hand, of course, you learn things mostly by people things, interacting with people and seeing how things work in the grown-up world. In the so real that, world, yeah. It was yeah. research for the writing. At least in law, it's very interesting to, with fantasy because you are dealing with political things and laws and breaking them. And Law has a very old tradition. Mm -hmm. Did you run into any particularly interesting excuses for breaking the law or stories that, that have helped uh, inform the, the novel? Nothing specific, but property cases are really, really good yeah. because you get people arguing and there's death and money involved, mm -hmm. ah. oh, that's which are very, very yeah, timeless. That really brings up, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about as basic and primal case as you can get. <laughs> timeless themes, I like that. Now, were, were you, you mentioned you were always writing. Was it always genre fiction, or did you start in regular fiction, or what was kind of your focus? It was always genre fiction, and then when I was in my MFA, I did more, I guess you would call it magical realism. Mm -hmm. It was still, had this fantastic element to it, but it was set in contemporary period. Gotcha. I'm very excited that you brought in the actual book cover. And you uh, just got this this week, right? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the books are probably we'll on their way to up, me. Put it up right side up, but that this is, awesome. is the whole jacket, right? Beautiful. It feels so cool, too. Yeah, I bet. This is your first one, It's my right? first one, That's yeah. so exciting. You know, it's very hard for new authors to get attention because attention, there's so many great books in the world, uh, not to mention just the ones being published every week. What is it about your story you feel you know, readers will get something out of it. Like, they should go and read What are they going to respond to? Obviously, it depends on the reader. Um, some people aren't going to like it. And 
that's the case with everyone. But if you're looking for a lot of swords and guts and adventure, it's going to be a lot, it's a lot more understated than that. Swords, um, guts, and adventure? adventure. Is yeah. Not, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, it's so, um, I mean, the plot is character driven and about people and their relationships with each other. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I think that makes it a little bit different is that fantasy is still really dominated by male lead characters. So my character, Tam here, is she's a product of her time, but she's also trying to reach beyond it. Mm. So she's sort of like a, I was thinking like Mary Shelley, the, the feminists around 1800 as sort of a model. Gotcha. And I, I like the idea, and I think a lot of people are saying, you know, we're tired of the medieval-based fantasy, and now we're getting tired of the grim, dark fantasy. And you've you've got something else for people to, to sample that I don't think anyone has seen. Well, I just found out there's apparently something called a fantasy of manners, mm-hmm. which is, I guess, a romance fantasy. Um, Maybe like Regis- a Gail Carriger or uh, like a Mary Robinette Kowal. Yeah, I mean, you know, and this to some extent was started as that, mm-hmm. as a fantasy of manners, with drawing rooms and people playing whist and it's a lot of the details are straight out of Pride and Prejudice or Sense of Sensibility. But the epic part is because who doesn't like dragons and right. who doesn't like epic? And if you're going to be having something epic, you might as well put it all the way in and not right. just be dealing with it on the little village level. Now, speaking of dragons, obviously we are big fans of dragons. Lem is, Lem is here joining us for this interview. Um, so how do, how do dragons uh, play a role in your storyline? They're kind of a big mystery. They were trapped. Nobody really knows how or what um, as a use for, as a political tool, essentially. Hmm. And I actually now know a lot more about it than I did when I wrote it, but... Um, but no spoilers. Right, no yeah. spoilers. So they're just kind of biding their time. Time doesn't pass for them the same way it does for us. Mm-hmm. So they're waiting for the opportunity to break free and go back to being real wild, scary, fierce dragons again instead of tamed dragons so that people can ride. So they're stuck in service against their will. They right. sound like, like pawns yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, enthrall. Mm, okay, Aww. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so the dragons are stuck. They're they're waiting for a way out, and we have these characters that come up mm-hmm. that provide perhaps a way out for them. Tell uh-huh. us a little, without you know telling people the whole story. Tell us a little bit about how that story is going to unfold. Well, some people would call it a chosen one story, mm-hmm. but it isn't. I think it isn't. A, it, there's one scene where he actually is considering, does he have to do this, and decides, no, he doesn't. Nothing's going to happen if he doesn't do it. And in fact, maybe he even shouldn't do it. It's not where duty t- takes him. And then decides, yes, I feel compelled to do this anyway, but it's not um, some magical compulsion. Mm, okay. So I think that's part of it. Um, it's just figuring out what the relationships are with all these different things going on and how to stand in position to different people. Um, and that's something that happens for both the main characters. And part of that is as they're figuring that out, they figure out what's going on with the dragons. So do you see this as, I mean, it's, it's written as a standalone novel now, but do you think you'll write more in this universe going forward or, or just you know, move on to the next kind of storyline in the future? Well, definitely more. I don't know when. Um, I've thought about doing a prequel. Oh, oh cool. That's interesting. Um, and a lot of people want a sequel. So, you know, you, you think about it. Right. Yeah. Um, Would the prequel involve the backstory of the dragons, then? Um, I don't think I'd go that, back that no, far. I'm thinking that about 100 years back. Okay. It's nice with a prequel because you can really kind of flesh out some of the world building. Right, there. exactly. You to, if you didn't make, if it didn't make it into the final version of the book, now you have an opportunity to kind of, you know, even for people who haven't yet read this novel, mm-hmm. they can start with the prequel and then they mm-hmm. have an even better understanding of what's going on in this book. But I do want to do some move away and do some other really different stuff too. Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to stick to putting out the same book time, time after time. You right. don't want to get stuck in that that channel, huh? Uh uh-uh, uh. Uh-uh. Yeah. That's pretty I, funny because we've we've talked about that a lot with other authors about how difficult it is to kind of break out of the 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 stories that you've written and kind of try something completely different from what you're very well known for. Um, do you have any idea of the kind of stuff you would like to do moving forward? Well, I want to do a, a actual science fiction, mm-hmm. and and um, I don't know if I want to do YA or not. I haven't really thought about that. I always like retellings, so trying to find the right story to do a retelling of in some way. Um, and I'm toying around with um, Greek mythology. Oh, nice. And, but I haven't figured out really what, nothing has landed yet um, as to what I would do with it. But there's a lot in the Iliad. Oh, yeah. So that, that's just such a good story. Right. And the, I, I think about that a lot, too. Arthurian legend has been, do, has been done a lot. There's been a lot of retellings of that, of the Odyssey and the Iliad. Not as much. Not as much. I like that. I like that you idea. You could do a, a cool sci-fi story about Icarus. 
and making the flying ma flying machine. Mm -hmm. flying you know the story I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, flying too close to the sun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I was making it sure. Yeah, I'm thinking know. about the Star Trek episode with the yeah. Um, yeah. Um, horns for Adonis. Right. <laughs> <laughs> with the big, the big old Apollo. Old yeah. That's cool. Uh, well, congratulations on getting published, by the way. Uh, that's, that's a huge, huge thing for, for any author to have the first novel out. Did you consider ever doing self-publishing? Because that's becoming more of a possibility and more of a trend for people. It's really a recent sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And this book took a long time to write. I got an agent in 2012. So we're coming up on summer of 2014. Yeah. Um, and I certainly want, didn't want to go self-published because of all the hassles that it entails and not being able to get into um, the community as much. And I think that's changing. Mm -hmm. But I think even two years ago, it wasn't like that. Mm, interesting. Um, and it is really, really nice to have an agent to do all the dealing with the people and the business and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> there's, so, there's, there's so much that goes on that people don't realize. The marketing and you know the title handling and dealing with bookstores and getting on shelves and all that stuff that you don't have to. Right. And Getting the contract yeah. hammered yeah. out to be the best contract it could be. Well, you're a right. lawyer, but you don't want to have to be a lawyer, No, right? well, not on that. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. I did read every word of my contract. <laughs> I'm sure you did, like, a little with a red pen, just going over things. Uh, so what do you say to aspiring writers who want to basically be where you are right now? Well, don't quit. This is coming out 20 years after I got my MFA. So I stuck with it. <laughs> um, so you got to stick with it. That's some persistence, so, yeah. Then the other thing you were talking about, you know, moving beyond stories that you've been telling. For me, this was the story that I didn't really want to tell and it kept poking up into everything else that I was writing and mm. finally I was like, well, damn it, I'm just going to tell this thing and then I'll have a clean slate and then I can write something I want to publish. There you go. And of course, since it was the one I really, really wanted to tell, it's the one that came out successful. Gotcha. So you have to tell the story you want to tell. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, before we jump into viewer questions, I was curious uh -huh. who is, who is uh, joining us here on I the table. I recognize her from Twitter. Yeah, this is, this is Jane Austen. <laughs> oh! Look at that. Um, who actually is, I ripped some lines off from her. So mm -hmm. I said I ripped details. There's, um, can, you again, can, you guys, can you guys see her? See? Hello, I'm Jane Austen. Yeah. Hello, I'm not a zombie yet. My parents yeah. gave her to me for my birthday a few Aww, years ago. That's, cool. that's awesome. Oh, she's got a little, she's oh, you got, got look up her skirt. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, very inappropriate. <laughs> she, wouldn't, she wouldn't be that okay with that. That is not done. <laughs> that is just not done, Veronica. <laughs> I was a big Jane Austen fan. I yeah? mentioned this on the audio podcast before, but when, when I was in high school, read a lot of Jane Austen. I, I don't think fans. I knew that. So I really like these takes. I like that that there's there's more of this kind of fantasy spin coming out. Well, if I can mm -hmm. read just a little bit. Yeah, sure. That's so this be great. is just the the epigraph, um, one of the two of them, and this was kind of what got the um, the love story. It's the basic formulation at the very core. Um, this is after Elizabeth and Darcy have gotten married. And she said, why on earth did you fall in love with me? And she says something to the effect of, I can see you going on once it began, but what got it started? And I don't remember what he says. And then she says, the fact is that you were sick of civility, of deference, of officious attention. You were disgusted with the women who were always speaking and looking and thinking for your approbation alone. I roused and interested you because I was so unlike them. So I wanted the woman who was not expected yeah. right on. to be the and who didn't expect to be in the role in the first place mm -hmm. to be the heroine in the, of the love story part. That's the great. Unexpected woman. It's nice to have different kinds of, of female characters and mm -hmm. female role models in, in books. And I think we're, we're getting a lot of influence from Jane Austen recently, I think, too, because of those kinds of strong female mm -hmm. characters that, that represent a lot more people than, mm -hmm. than you might expect earlier. Um, so we do have viewer questions. This one comes from Serendi, um, who actually wants to know a little bit about your educational background. Uh, does St. John's have as amazing a curriculum as it sounds? So I asked a couple of my friends this what I should say. And one of them said I should say, could you elaborate on that further? <laughs> <laughs> Smart friend. <laughs> uh, and one of them said I should say it was even more amazing than it sounds. And it really is. Um, there's a lot that just, just from reading 2,000 years worth of literature, and it's just the tiniest little bit that's out there, but you just, it sticks and you learn and you think and I know all sorts of weird little things that I would never have known if I'd just gone and gotten an English degree. Mm. We have a couple of super questions to finish up with here. Okay. Uh, the first one is if you could ban a word what would it be? 
or, or maybe even just put it under interdiction for a long time if you don't want a full on ban. Well, all I can think of is all the ones that like teenagers use, or that the, oh, you know. Like and I'm trying to think of an actual slang right, words, yeah, like selfie uh, 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 or uh, right, um, the feels. And I guess now, oh. I guess now it's. Um, You're guilty of that. Well, you, we both did feels jokes, maybe like in a very recent episode. Yeah, so. I think you're right. Apparently, yeah. the new thing for a really good book is to say that it, it rated as flails. Oh, I have no flails. clue what that means. I don't know. I don't know that one. Do say you it know? again. Flails. Flails. Yes. Kind of like flu. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what it means. I just saw this yesterday. It, just it provokes an emotional uh, reaction that makes yeah. you flail. So I guess I can't think of a particular word that I would like to ban. Uh, I, people should. I'd like people to use correct grammar and reduce their use of adverbs. Ah, that's a good one. Yeah. That, we should start a public service campaign for adverb reduction. Right. <laughs> and our second question is, uh, what are your top three must-reads? My top three must-reads, well, of course, that always changes. Um, but, well, Pride and Prejudice, kind of obviously. Makes sense. Um, I think Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy goes up mm. on there. The path or the road is really, really good and really gut wrenching. But um, and that's that's a must read too. But um, Blood Meridian is the one that really kind of got me, and it got a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Heart of Darkness and Blood Meridian and William Faulkner's Sanctuary mm -hmm. all have very interesting villains. I have a copy of William Faulkner's Sanctuary from the pulp reissue in the 50s. It's like one of my favorite books because it's such a great novel and then it's got this lurid cover on it. It's a nice juxtaposition. Yeah, um, I think the Coen brothers need to do it as a oh, movie. that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. they would do it would that be so well. Yeah. I, I love that. Because it's such a strange book. Yeah, it fit, it, oh, that's, yeah. A really, that's a really good fit. Yeah. yeah. You so should write the screenplay. Oh, there you go. Oh, sure. There we go. We put that into the world. Well, Anne and Jane, thank you so much for, for joining us here at the Space Castle. Well, thank you. Yeah. Does it take off? Um, yeah. yeah, shortly. Yeah, we have to say goodbye first. People can't <laughs> and see and the does it have process. a phone booth? Uh, phone booths show up, but only when the doctor arrives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Police call boxes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her first novel, Moth and Spark, is out as of February 20th. Check it out, folks. Well, that's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there is tons. You can join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com and subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. 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 Lem, hey Lem, can you get the lights?